The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. So today's reading um, comes from a game designer who is Pulsifer, who is traditionally worked in war games. Uh, I believe he's done some, some of the board games as well, uh, but for the most part, I think he's recognized for his, for his war gaming work. And um, there was actually, there's actually quite a lot of um, war gaming journals, uh, mostly written by designers for fans or for fan or for fan or by fans for fans. Um, things like the Complete Strategist used to be um, like the PC gamer of of wargaming, right, you know, uh, it's like this is what's happening and this, these are our thoughts, these are our critiques. Um, and that particular reading, um, I feel, is very typical of that sort of era of maybe late 80s, early to mid 90s uh, magazine publications. Um, and it's interesting because um, Already at that time, sure, there are people who say wrote the core rule sets for various games like you know Axis and Allies or, or, or things like Dungeons and Dragons. But there was going to be this assumption that if you are interested in something like board gaming, you are also interested in creating your own scenarios. You are already halfway a game designer, and so you have to keep all of these things in mind. Particularly, you know, if, if, if you are a game master, has anyone been like a dungeon master or a game master for a role playing group? Okay, you are basically a game designer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're taking rule sets that somebody else came and cherry picking the stuff that you really want to work with and discarding the stuff that doesn't and then coming up with, with your own rules. Um, so, um, so just as a sample of reading, I, felt, I believe this is the first time I've asked you to read anything from the tabletop book. Um, second time. I think second time? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So randomness first. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, this particular piece of reading also is also a nice little time capsule of how people used to write about uh, game design. Uh, it, it's a fairly modern piece of writing, but still, it, it still has that same sort of style. Um, so there's a lot of examples of like, this is how this theoretical game is going to be played, and I'm going to write it out completely in prose. You know, it's not going to say, uh, and, e and even when it talks, when, when they refer to Games that already exist, like I believe they do cite Vinci uh, uh, at one point. Yeah. yeah, they again they explain all they explain the, the mechanics that are, that they're discussing are out in prose. It's not like in point form or anything like that. It's just free uh, free prose. I don't think there was ever any assumptions that you know um, if you contributed an essay for something like the Complete Strategist that you that diagrams that you included will be included into the magazine, right? Because a lot of people who actually created uh, those essays weren't necessarily artists, and um, that's not to say that you didn't get have, ha have diagrams in magazines like that. But it was expensive. This is before desktop publishing, so people just got really, really used to describing things in prose, describing core game mechanics in prose, not even point form or bullet points. Um, so, so. There were basically two suggestions that he has on how to deal with the whole free player problem. You know, that, like the, um, actually, be, be, before I get into his suggestions, can anyone uh, like, quickly sum up what's the main problem with having the designing a game for three players? Um, uh, well, one of them is Turtles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where two of the players sort of go at it for most of the game. And then they weaken themselves, and then the third player just sits back, just comes in, beats up both. Okay, so that's for, for for a certain set of rules. That's one kind of strategy which encourages you to basically not interact with anybody else, and then win the game, right? Well, I was gonna say there's there's uh, positions where it's just one player chooses which the other two players wins. Mm -hmm. So so I believe king making was king -making. the was the name that was given to that. Um, you may not be in a position to win the game, but in a game with only three players, you might have enough influence to basically say, I don't like you, therefore you are not going to win. Therefore the other person is going to win, even though I can win. Right? So there were a few more, more sort of like subtle problems that he described. Anyone remember any of them? What? Yeah. 
politics? So if two people decide to team up on the other player, the other player pretty much can't win? Uh, he actually brought, yeah, he brought that up. Uh, this, um, it does come up in a reading. That, uh, it's not necessarily described as a problem, but something that does happen, mm -hmm. and happens often. So you either take advantage of it, or uh, as a designer, or you, or you will, or, or, or your game suffers because you hadn't thought about it. Right? This whole idea of somebody's in the lead, and two people pro probably want to do a temporary alliance at the very least, right? To 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 take down that player. There was one called sandbagging, and I'm yeah. actually forgetting what that means here. Yeah. I think it said that um, it's saying that you're going less well off than you actually are. Oh like yeah, pretending that you system. are like 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 or you're trying like bordering on lying, right? You know, and it's like, no, I'm not gonna win the game in the next turn. Don't worry about me. Deal with him. He's scarier, you know, and that that sort of like sort of deceit, uh, where where. You have to like actively conceal the fact that you are not in the lead. Um, then there are some games that say, "All right, here are some ways that you can do that." Um, I'm not sure. Are we having a play crunch? I think we yeah, are. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. So um, crunch is a game about being a banker. You're um, trying to fill up your golden parachute before the market crashes, um, and uh, you are encouraged to play the game in a three-piece suit so that you can actually actively hide cards. Um, and um, and the idea is that at the end of the game, the amount of money that you've managed to sequester for your own personal use, including any cards that you have have of hidden on on yourself, uh, will win you the game. Um, it's not about keeping your banks afloat at all. It's 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 all about leaving with the most, with with largest personal fortune. Um, so it's this wry satirical game, um, but that one actively encourages you to conceal how well you're performing. Now it's a two-player game. It's not like a like a three play thing. So that you are also well aware that your opponent is doing the same sort of thing. You are just trying to do the best that you can in accumulating as much cash as possible because that that's what's going to win your game. But in a situation with three players, you can imagine a situation where if someone could figure out that you are in the lead and that person can catch up. Then you know what can they do? Like pass cards to the to the player that they want to win. You know, for instance, uh, and that might be tough because. Um, someone might not be able to interfere with that process. Um, in the game, uh, in the game Punta, there's like, uh, there was a game, you're like, a, Punta, you're a like politician in some like, in some Latin American banana republic, mm -hmm. and your goal is to embezzle as much foreign aid money as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things is that the, the number, the amount of foreign aid money drawn each turn is variable, and like only the president really knows. Mm -hmm. And so. Like that's sort of the fit parts of the game is that sometimes like the president won't draw very much, mm -hmm. which might like cause evil to launch a coup against him because they think he's lying and taking a lot for himself and they're scared from winning for that reason. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, basically there's so much uncertainty about how much evil. Like it's not it's not even computable how much evil happened there. This is Junta, Junta yeah. with a J, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, it is neat, right? It, it sort of plays around around with this idea that you know you have this dictator uh, that's that seems to be amassing a large personal fortune. Whether or not the dictator the, the, that that is actually being successful in the process of amassing a bit large personal fortune, it is that that game is designed to paint a giant target. Um, and we have another game uh, here called King of Tokyo, which is. Uh, Basically, giant monsters trying to take over the bay, uh, to uh, to Tokyo Bay. Every single generic giant robot, giant dinosaur, octopus thing, mecha dinosaur, um, and uh, and whoever happens to be on king of the hill at that point has a giant target on, on them. And the game mechanics also support that. That's what the game's all about. Um, so. So those were some of the problems, and he and he proposes two solutions. Not necessarily the only two solutions, but the, these are the ones that, that occurs to him. That in particularly in a war gaming scenario, uh, might work. And they're actually kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Anyone remember one of those two solutions? Mm -hmm. If one person gets ahead, then I think and. They cannot be significantly defeated before they win the game. 
I think equilibrium was the opposite of that. Awesome. Yeah, uh, so, so you've actually just completed two answers into one, which is good. <laughs> so so the, the equilibrium, if I recall correctly from the reading, the equilibrium method was, or design goal, let, let's say, like if you manage to design that, is taking advantage of things like the balance of power theory, which is if there is a person who's clearly ahead, everybody else who is weaker is probably going to band up and take you down. And if you balance the game in a certain way, you give them the tools to do that, and thus take anyone who seems to be ahead back to a sort of uh, uh, equal power level. That's uh, balance, uh, balance of power theory is something from political science. Uh, I've only heard about it in passing. If there's anybody here who's taken political science classes, you can tell me if I'm getting this right or wrong. But the, the whole thing is not a far-fetched idea, right? You know, you got, if you've got a powerful nation, other nations who are bordering that, that, that powerful na nation are likely to either team up with the powerful nation or more li likely to band their, en their, their energies together, even though they may not be ideologically linked or anything. They're ideologically linked against the, the powerful nation. You know? So the same thing goes for players. Um, so basically it comes down to giving everybody the tool to take down the leader a notch. Um, and and does re restore everything to to a sort of, of equilibrium state, and then your your um, your success criteria for the game probably isn't who's going to to gain such a massive lead because the game is deliberately designed to restore everything to equilibrium. You have you need to have some other kinds of success criteria. Maybe the game is time limited, for instance. Maybe the game has different goals for each player or something. Um, so even though your power levels are about the same, you might be able to accomplish, uh, get victory points on something faster than others. Um, what about the, al uh, the alternative, which you hinted at, which was basically um, making it difficult to take down the person who's in the lead once they're already in the lead. Um, so th there was like, he had one very specific implementation of this uh, or one uh, one particular rule of thumb on how 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 effective must the person in the lead be in order to prevent the king making and the sign making and totally making everything. Remember this? Remember this? So the, the 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 basic idea is that you must be able to do it in in oh, in, in one turn in a single turn. You should be able to. If you are in the lead, you should be able to complete the game and win the game in a single turn. I'm not so sure whether I agree with that. Um, but I, and I don't think he means win it on your turn. I think it means like in a round of people, like by the time, if you're in the lead in the game, you should be able to do something that to cement that lead so that within that turn, no one's going to be able to do anything about it and you should be able to fill up the game. Um, this is a this is for games where there is like a clear win condition that's based on overpowering your opponents. Um, then you don't want it to have this situation where yeah I'm in the lead but I'm still but everybody else still has enough time to um, to take me down to the point that somebody else can then catch up and be in the lead uh, because that basically means that you uh, that the first person to get in the lead will probably lose and that. That's 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 sad, um, but we've seen that in certain computer games. We 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 we've seen games where you know whoever who is in the lead has a giant target painted on their back, and and you know you're expected to be taken down. If you're the first one in the lead, you are probably going to get hit. But then that now gives you enough time to be able to pull ahead. So so that's that's closer to the equilibrium style, right? So I think I heard someone give. Say just say oh, Mario, Kart. Mario Kart being the obvious one. You, know, the, the you get increasingly powerful weapons the further behind you get, uh, or useful things. Um, there's an example in this book here, um, the uh, Rules of Play. This is this is the paperback version. Uh, it's a hard, hardback version um, of uh, Super Monkey Ball, um, and basically all their weapons face forward. So if you're number one. <laughs> You can only <laughs> shoot for it. There's nothing to shoot. There's nobody ahead of you. So it's not actually a dis it's not a technical disadvantage. It's not like a weapon that slows you down. But you know, it's it's a useless thing. You you get the power ups that are useless. Um, 
So um, a lot of these uh, feed into a different way of looking at games uh, that is very formal, very techy, um, and one that you probably heard of mentioned multiple times in this class and in other classes as well, and that's just feedback systems. Uh, I'm not talking about UI feedback, I'm talking about feedback from a cybernetic sense. Anyone here has heard about cybernetics from another class? Yeah. Oh, well, I'll just go with the feedback systems that you used in your uh, the other the class that we did, the design video. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely brought it up. Yeah, again. where you had a forward feedback system and backward feedback system, mm -hmm. basically. Positive and negative, yeah. Uh, if you were winning, you either win by mo start winning by more, or mm -hmm. you're losing, you start to catch up. The examples like chess and Robert are two good ones for that. Right, so that's the whole basic idea of cybernetics uh, is based on sort of automated control. You know, you've got, you, you create systems, mechanical or electronic or with a set of rules that are basically going to either accelerate or uh, um, the, the sort of, you know, to sort of slow, or snowball the, 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 uh, the performance of the system or bring it back to equilibrium. Um, if, if this sounds very familiar to something in Mechi or E or something, that's that's completely expected. You know, this all originally came from that anyway. Um, so the basic model is that you have some sort of sensor, something that detects um, an environmental change. It could be something that detects the um, the state of your game, uh, some way of telling you this is the current state that you're looking at. That goes to a comparator, which is a need, which needs more space because it's a longer word. Comparator, which performs some sort of logical assessment on on the state of, 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 of the system that you're looking at, and then you go into an actuator. which performs some sort of action. And it's called feedback, because this thing just keeps feeding back. Right? Um, real life systems that do this, like what are some of the simplest real life systems that do this, like electronically or mechanically, without human knowledge, uh, without hu human in intervention? Washing machine. Washing machine? Thermostat. Thermostat. Mm -hmm. Washing machine does that with what water levels, I think, right? Well, if it shakes too much, it stops. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, so, uh, so much that things get too hot. Turn on the cooling system, you know, or shut off the heating system. Um, I wonder if like that emergency drain in the city. Sure. Yeah. The little there's like a hole at the top of sinks where like the water yeah. gets like to around there. Yeah, yeah. The sensors, you know, whether the water has actually hit that hole, you know, and the con the pairs. Uh, I guess the sensor is the level of the water. The the comparator is it is it at the height of the hole, and then the actuator is if it's at the height of the hole, go out the hole, right? So so it's actually just like physics is the entire system for you. But it's been engineered in a way to take advantage of that. Uh, systems like autopilot. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm just sort of, sort of keeping you on the path that you're supposed to do, and it's always just doing minute little corrections. Um, majority of these things are real world applications of these uh, negative feedback systems. So, and the idea is that, you know, if there is a change in one direction, pull it back. You know, if it goes in the other direction, pull it forward. Uh, so, that it, so that it always sort of uh, hovers around the same, <coughs> the, the, the same point. These are like deliberately designed systems try to do this all the time. But there are a lot of real world systems that do the opposite, right? Stuff that snowballs. For instance, a snowball <laughs> rolling down the hill. You know, as it goes down, it gets larger, and it, it, it makes it slightly easier to 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 continue rolling. I think surface area in contact to the snow actually decreases at least uh, from a ratio point, uh, point point of view, makes it easier to keep rolling, and it, it picks up more snow and it gets larger and larger and larger. Um, other positive feedback systems in real. World? I don't know the name of the game, but there's this. Start off as an asteroid. Astro Is that what it is? Astro what? It's like, like you start off as like a small asteroid. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that you eat other small asteroids and you grow up to be a planet. And then at that point, 
asteroids become really easy to gobble up, but you want to go out to other smaller planets than you, and then eventually become the sun, and then keep on getting bigger until you become a black hole, hmm. and then eventually you get so large that you just eat everything up. So there are, there are two games that remind that reminds me of one is Orbital, uh, which was a Nintendo game. Do, do, do you know? Wait, which one? What? Which game? Uh, is that sounds like Kamari Damacy. It sounds like Kamari Damacy. It sounds like a genre. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yes. get bigger so you can get bigger. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, what's the game um, done by Andy Milan? Um, Orbis. Osmos. Osmos. Uh, Ooh, that's yeah, I think that's a PC and portable device. device. Yeah. Uh, um, so that Osmos is an interesting situation because yes, the bigger you get, the bigger you can get because the idea of Osmos is like you know this like little amoeba like blob. So asteroid amoeba like blob. You can eat anything smaller than you, and everything that you eat makes you bigger. So you can eat even bigger things, but it actually makes it more difficult for you to navigate. Uh, because you're more massive now. So you actually have both negative and positive loops going on at once. Well, I have another positive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, bombs. Bombs? Yeah, that's only means exploding. Uh, it makes other things explode? Well, there's that. There are also like some, some bombs were no, no, positive. Yeah, bombs were Oh, so like, 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 like you're using an, an, an atomic bomb to set off a hydrogen bomb? That's what I'm saying? So, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, you can sort of, uh, positive feedback often happens, I mean, <laughs> um, military conflict, right? You know, if you've got overwhelming, if you've got overwhelming forces, you know, being, uh, every engagement just makes the, makes the ratio, tech, uh, if everything goes according to military doctrine, uh, every engagement is going to give you yet a, a greater advantage, Thirty. Um, so the way how this has been applied in games is, you know, just, just to make it li li literal, you have a state, some sort of state of the game. Um, am I getting this right? Yeah. You have the state of the game. Uh, you have, I think it's, wait, hold on. Let me just make, make sure I've got this perfectly right. Here we go. You have some sort of scoring function. Um, it doesn't have to be the literal score, but it has to be some way of assessing how close you are to some sort of goal. Um, so either the short-term goal or the overall goal of a game, some sort of scoring function. Uh, and that goes into some sort of player input. There are some versions of this diagram that separates this into two things. That's kind of like the player decides what they're going to do and then actually executes the input. Uh, and that goes back in, actually, there is one more stage, sorry. Um, there is one more stage and that's the kind of m the mechanical bias. So, so the state of the game can be revealed in some sort of scoring fu function. The player as assesses what they want to do and then tries to execute it. Th that is filtered within the computers or the board games or the card games interpretation of what that input's going to do, uh, and then that feeds back into game state, right? Uh, so for games like Mario Kart, you know, you perceive that you are doing you you perceive you are doing badly because you all you know you are the last one. Uh, at the back of of, of the um, of the eight races, uh, you drive your your vehicle into one of those rotating boxes because you know, like you're deliberately steering into them because they're probably your only chance to, for to be able to catch up again. Uh, you get uh, usually something really really sweet because you're all the way behind and the way how the game is designed. If you're all the way behind, you get all the best toys. You get all the the every single tool that you need to be able to catch up is given to you when you're all the way at the back. That's the mechanic bias. All right? It gives you the right tool and that affects game state because now you have this wonderful tool and you use it, hopefully it works, you know, and then you gain a couple of uh, places up in the race. Um, so th there are a couple of other examples that are a little bit you know, clearer. So say, say basketball. 
if you've got a situation where you've got five people on each side, you could do a game where if you start to have a lead of five points, you lose a player. You know, someone's benched. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you lose that player. Right? Um, so is that negative or is that positive? That's negative, right? Because you know, you are, you are, you are, you are, you're saying, all right, you are far enough ahead, we're going to take away one of your advantages. Um, is there another way to do negative feedback on that example? Instead of taking away a player, add another player to the other side. You can add another player to the other side, right? That's also negative feedback. You know, that, 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 e even though you're adding something, what you're really doing is you're going to give an advantage to someone who's not doing so well and does try to bring things to equilibrium. Um, positive feedback version of this would be. Turn the three point line into the four point line more teams. It's like being on. Oh, okay. All right. Time you score a point, the other team loses a player. Yeah. Okay. You're playing basketball. I was thinking something more more literal, like just giving the person who the the team that's ahead extra players. Right. You know. That's 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 like. You could do it. Every five points that you gain, you get one more player. And pretty soon you've got two more players. And pretty soon you've got three more players. And then, pretty soon you have two more players. And then you just have more, more people than anyone can move on the basketball court. And as a result of that, you kind of win by default. Some games have like, a, some mechanism, like somebody's on fire and they make three shots in a row, and all of a sudden they're just like way they, better at playing. They run faster, they, yeah. they jump a little higher. Yeah, and, and the computer game, you can totally do it. Uh, no, no, no. Well, in sports, sports is a thing. Talk about momentum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like statistically, if you're if you're throwing a good game, and you're doing better, like more and more pitches, better and better pitches, mm -hmm. you are playing better. But I, I I'm wondering whether that's correlation or causation. It's like if, if the reason why you're doing better because right now they're right now they're thinking it's it's causation. It's causation. They're yeah, thinking yeah. it. It's yeah. new a new study that just came out. But it definitely comes up in sort of sports psychology, right? You know, it's like you, you are sort of building on the mental momentum of doing well. Um, and similarly, a team that's not doing well can lose hope. That's, that's again, pos that's positive feedback. I just want to, to be extremely clear about the use of positive. It's like anything that sort of amplifies uh, uh, differences that already exist. So let me... There are a couple of things to, to, to think about um, when it comes to feedback, especially as a problem-solving technique for design. Um, so we've already talked about how negative feedback tries to bring things down to equilibrium. So it, it's, it's a stabilizing force. Uh, if, if, uh, if your game is like out of control and unpredictable and chaotic, negative feedback can sort of like rein things in a little bit. It's like sure, maybe may unpredictable, but it's not going to hurt me so bad. Uh, or if somebody gets an advantage, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be a runaway advantage. Um, similarly, if your game's just kind of, um, you know, actually always hovering at equilibrium and nobody seems to be getting an advantage, then positive feedback me mechanisms will destabilize, will destabilize that. It will, it will make it more likely that somebody who gets an advantage will actually get a large advantage. Uh, uh, and that could be a good thing if your game's kind of like dull and it's always just kind of hovering at the same level. Um, but there's a, but, um, there's a trade-off with that because any amount of feedback that you're adding into, a, a, into your game, especially if this kind of automated feedback, this is something that your rules are automatically generating, um, can actually be taking control away from players. And as a result of that, might actually make the game less engaging. So even a game like uh, with like a pot is, all right, this game is too stable. We're going to add some positive feedback mechanisms so that people who who have an advantage can sort of capitalize on that advantage. But if it, if that's not done right, then you've just got a situation where once once some, someone starts winning, everybody else loses interest because there's no way that they can sort of catch up. Uh, so it destabilizes it in the point that yeah, someone's going to win this game, whereas previously it's always stuck at equilibrium. But it's actually lost. It, it, but it's very easy to sort of lose people in that process because you've just created an automated system to take control away from that. So that's one danger um, of putting in a feedback system. Um, also, 
we talked about bringing things down to equilibrium to sort of like make things a little bit easier for people to catch up or to make uh, advantages a little bit less drastic. Um, that can also make your game much longer, right? Because nobody gets an advantage. And depending on your win condition, depending on your end of game conditions, uh, could actually just you know make it uh, interminably long. Um, uh, you could take a half an hour game and make it a one hour game. So on the flip side, the positive feedback game can actually help rein in the length of the game. So if your game is currently taking you know an hour long or something like that, and and your victory conditions happen to be on get, gaining an advantage over your uh, the the opponents, then a positive feedback system can help speed that along, right? So okay, maybe we can cut cut it down by half by just giving some advantages to the person who's ahead, or penalizing the people who are behind. Um, that's a Interesting little side effect, which is um, positive, because positive feedback builds on itself, um, if you have an advantage early on, like you have an early success, then uh, positive feedback is going to be the mechanism that's going to help you build on that. On the other hand, if you have a negative feedback system in your game, which means everything is kind of being brought down to uh, an equilibrium, but everyone's getting closer to actually finishing the game, but no one really has like a huge lead, then late successes mean a lot more. That last boost when you are near the final, uh, the, 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 the winning line, uh, the, the, well, what, what's the, finish the finish line, the finish line. <laughs> that last boost of the fin uh, uh, before you hit the finish line on the very last round of Mario Kart means a lot because the whole game is designed with this huge amount of negative feedback. Um, and, uh, and could make all the difference. Uh, if people have played Mario Kart, where that was pretty much the game, it was like the last, those last five seconds of it. Someone just up hit the W shell in the last five seconds and you know, had no chance of stopping them. So negative feedback prioritizes what happens late, late in the game. Whereas positive feedback prioritizes what happens earlier on in the game. The strategies that you pick, the cards that you happen to draw and play right at the beginning of the game or something, positive, feed, uh, positive feedback stresses that. Um, and finally, always keep in mind that any interaction of game systems probably creates emergent feedback loops even if you hadn't designed them in. Um, so what you want to do is you want to try to find that. There's a tool out there that I've seen some student teams use, and I don't know whether it's going to be useful for you. I'm just going to clue you in. Has anyone heard of causal loop diagrams? It's from economics. <coughs> you have? It's a, it's a very simple concept. You just basically write in your variables uh, in your game. Um, and you can add in a few sort of in-between variables if you know how players are thinking about your game. So. Uh, I've been using Mario Kart too much for an example. Let's pick another game with a obvious feedback loop that everyone in this room probably knows. Chess? Chess? Chess, the number of pieces. Okay, so, so number of pieces. In chess, sort of influences the um, number of attack paths. So, which means uh, number of pieces, it, 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 it will influence the number of pieces being threatened, of, of your opponent's pieces being threatened. I, I, I should write over Which then influences the number of opponent, opponent pieces taken. Now, if I flip this around a little bit, I think I could make an argument that if I switch this to number of my own pieces, rather than my own <coughs> opponent pieces, then it connects. But not everything is a positive connection. Number of pieces that I have means I, if I have more pieces, I have more attack paths. Sort of, it's not exactly a linear con 
car, 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 but you can sort of imagine on chess set, right? I have more pieces than, than, than you, I have more ways to attack <coughs> than, than you. If I have more ways to attack than you, then actually I have fewer pieces threaded because I get also more ways to defend. So I'm going to say defend or attack parts. But anything that I can attack, I can prevent from. Uh, uh, I say, well, if you take this piece, then I'm just going to take the piece that you just used. Uh, and it's going to be a one for one trade, I'll still have more pieces than you. Um, and so if I can, if fewer of my pieces are threatened, um, that means I can, let's see, if the number of pieces are threatened goes down, then the number of pieces that I can kick goes up. Wait. No, no not, not yours. Not right. I think, yeah, I, 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 I think I, no, yeah, that should pieces. still be yours. Hmm? Yeah, the number of your pieces threatened goes down, the number of your, of your pieces taken goes down as well. Yeah. So those two are positive. Yes, yes, that's yeah. right. You are right. You are right. So, and that should just increase. And, and, and if the number of pieces taken goes down, if the number of pieces, uh, of pieces taken goes up, then I have fewer pieces. If I have fewer pieces taken, then I have more, more pieces. So we have two pluses and we have two minuses, which means <coughs> overall this entire loop is called a reinforcing loop. Right? This is positive feedback loop. Um, you can connect this to other things. Uh, maybe in chess, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not terribly good at causal loop diagrams to begin with. Uh, but in chess, you, can, you might be able to connect it to other things like the positioning of pieces, for instance, or the value of pieces. Um, and some of those might be reinforcing. Uh, and reinforcing is basically another way of saying it's a positive feedback loop. Um, another way that you can say is there's a balancing loop, which means actually a negative feedback loop. And that's usually depicted with a. Uh, depict it with a letter B. The students that I've seen use this well are students from like economics and management who actually learn that because they're trying to study things like supply chains and how a system works in the industry. And that's why they've already used this tool and then they can put it in. Um, and, uh, but, you know, so it might be worth looking up. Uh, it might be a useful diagnostic tool for your game if you're just trying to figure out what are all of the different loops and just like write just write out all of your variables um, and figure out whether things even up, two negatives and two positives gives you a reinforcing loop. Uh, positive, 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 positive gives you a reinforcing loop. Positive, positive, negative, and that's it, gives you a balancing loop. Basically, <coughs> the, the negative the, the overall add up to 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 positive, positive, to positive, positive, negative. So um, the one thing to keep in mind is that occasionally what happens is that you have something like a, like a time delay. And that's the location for a time delay. And that means things sometimes will end up oscillating uh, because you have time lag. So you get a benefit in something. Um, we, we had a game, for instance, where it was about climate change. And uh, you, can, you, can put money, you, you can invest money into research. Yeah, at some point of time in the far, far future, that pays off, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to pay off right away. So, um, so, it, so that may end up in situations where you start getting things like big fluctuations around. It's still sort of balancing in terms of equilibrium, but it's but just like a thermostat that's you know very slow to respond. You might have something like a heater that warms up a room, and it makes the room too warm before the sensor actually realizes that it's warm enough. And then it shuts it off and then the room becomes really, really cold before the sensor realizes that it's too cold and then turns it back on again. And thus you get these, these, these oscillations. So keep in mind also things like time lag when you're drawing out these diagrams. How long does it take this advantage to turn into that advantage or this increase to turn into that decrease? Um, and. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. So even though the terms are negative and positive feedback, usually like it seems sort of weird because usually positive means like a multiplier greater than one, and negative means a multiplier between zero and one. In the sense that like mm -hmm. how much does your point lead really mean? Or like how much if I have a one point lead right now, if the positive feedback means this is really like a two point lead because mm -hmm. it's going to provide more for me later, and 
even though the unit says I'm one more, the negative of wins it's like more often means I'm like, it's actually more like a half point weed mm -hmm. because it means less than it really does. Whereas like, yeah, it means like power grid, for instance, I know definitely have a case where sometimes negative feedback can literally be negative in the sense that like, taking this lead right now could actually hurt me because of the game could actually like hurt me long. Yeah, I think positive and negative, uh, since it was originally inherited from maths, um, cybernetics, it's actually referring to like a differential, yeah. rather than the, um, the it's, it's referring to the rate of change, right? So, um, yeah. rather than the, the actual multiplier. Yeah. <coughs> so, so that's, that's, that's something that we, that we've, uh, that, that, that's some baggage that we've taken on. Uh, but it, it sort of does, it, it, and it's not because some people think negative feedback means bad, right? It's like, no, negative feedback could mean good, and could mean that a negative feedback for someone who's behind could be an advantage. Um, so the terminology doesn't quite make it easy for, it, uh, for everyone to use, um, but it's something that, we, that is currently in use. So it's good to know that game designers do use these terms. Hmm? You're yeah. talking about like control system like positive feedback. Bad. <laughs> a control system where positive feedback will be bad. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the opposite of the word control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chain, chain reaction might be a great way to describe that, you know, for instance. Um, any other questions about these ideas? A lot of this stuff that I've been talking about um, is known as first order cybernetics, which is basically the system it's doing its own thing happily, and if I'm taking a look at the system from the outside, you know, I don't really have any influence on how it's going to perform. Um, but there is a second order, that school, whole school of second order cybernetics that I'm totally unfamiliar with, which actually takes into account having a person in the loop, which you would think would be a lot more applicable for games, uh, especially games being played by people. But uh, I admit, I don't know much about second order. So if you're interested in a research project or something like, like that, you know, a thesis or something like that, come and talk to me. And I, will, yeah, I would love to be able to find out more about that with you. All right. One final word. This is a very formal way of looking at game systems. Uh, just as I have already, I just admitted that it doesn't take people's involvement in the process uh, uh, very well. Um, it is not necessarily the case that the formal ways of looking at a system, just looking at how the rules interact, uh, is necessarily always the best way to look at, at, at games. In many ways, in <coughs> many occasions, it is actually not a useful technique. You know, I can have all of these systems in my rules, but if you know, if people are going to read my rules and interpret my rules as you've already seen happen in this class differently, um, then they are, you know, they may be motivated to do things that operate against my assumptions because there's something else in my narrative, my aesthetic, in their own individual motivations. Like if somebody wants to take down somebody else in the game just because they happen to hate that person, you know, and it's outside of the game rules, you know, then uh, nothing in the rules is going to tell me that. But it's still going to affect how that game gets played. And I want to, and I may want to take that into account. Um, the game of diplomacy, for instance, you know, uh, has to take into account the fact that, that you're probably playing it with people that you know and you have some sort of existing relationship with them. I don't think it does a very, very good job of <laughs> insulating you from the fallout of the game. Um, <laughs> everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? Okay, just aren't friends with people that you play diplomacy with anymore. Um, that's why I, I try to avoid playing that game. But I like talking about it. Uh, so you know, the, the, we'll we'll be going into things like games, games for social play, and the social function of games, how you interact with with people. Like, um, some other topics are going to be things like games as simulation, games as a um, as, as a slightly flawed mirror to the real world, but an interesting way, you know, but it could be a fun house mirror, which could be fun. Um, so, so we'll be looking at that in, in weeks uh, ahead. This is probably about as formal as we get. We've been talking about things like information systems, that's also very formal. Just keep in mind, that's just like one school of game design uh, and writing about game design.
So we have games that all have an interesting way of dealing with this. Some of them, you are going to see these problems come up, like especially in free play games. How many people we have in class today? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine eight, ten, eleven. Okay. So eleven, that's like four one four person game. No, that's like two four people games. And one two game. Okay. So we get about three games going on um, all at once. Um, some games like King of Tokyo is very much a King of the Hill game, so it's deliberately trying to ask you to take down the the, the person who's in the league. And the game mechanics make you wonder whether being in the lead is really all that great. Um, so it's playing around with like a small world is um, oh, yeah. occupying territory with your armies. Yeah. 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 The reason they talked about Vinci, small worlds, they update of Vinci. Yeah. A little faster to play, fits better in this class. We have Vinci too. If anybody wants to take a look at that, we uh, we have that in our lab, but we don't play that often because it takes like two hours. Um, unless of course you already know the rules. Lifeboats. It's about um, a bunch of sailors trying to get to the uh, uh, trying to get to safety. Basically, the boat is sink. Uh, the boats are sinking, and they're all trying to get to safety. And everyone's jumping on and pushing people out of lifeboats. <laughs> um, and swimming two lifeboats and stuff like that. So, so it's all about knocking people out. Um, Oiki Toiki and... Uh, what was the last one? And 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 yeah, I actually know relatively little about these ones. I forget. Um, these, yeah. Uh, uh, Hoi is a game about bluffing. Okay. Um, these were recommended uh, by some other scholars when I shared with them. Well, that's the same basic time. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and El Grande, Spanish game about being a Calavero. Yep. Not, I totally made that word. Did you type we have, yeah. we have English rules in here? Yes, we have English rules in here. Okay. Yeah, yeah the, the box is German, but, yeah. the, but I'm pretty sure I looked in there earlier and I saw a uh, uh, British sheet of English rules. Uh, Intrigue is the game that I like the theme the most. It's basically you run a university and you're trying to put your postdocs in other universities. Uh, that's not what the game says in the box, but I would like you to try playing the game with that theme in mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting game because you are trying, you are doing exactly the same thing that everybody else is trying to do, but in order to succeed in the game, you have to put your troops, your 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 scholars, uh, into other people's territory. Uh, and they are trying to put it into yours. And there's some mutual be uh, benefit and a whole lot of quality. Yeah. So a lot of opportunities for you to sort of, it's, it's a pretty good negative feedback game because what it does, it gives you a whole bunch of tools to basically take the <coughs> words in a read. Um, and uh, take a look at which, which games hide the win condition, or, or not hide the progress of players from you. you know, some, in some of these games, you can easily see who's ahead. In some of these games, it's really hard to tell, and that's deliberate so that you don't have these situations where someone all gangs up um, on the people who are, who are in the league. Um, look at the, how they avoid things like turf playing and send, you know, how they discourage things like sandbagging. Uh, or maybe sometimes they encourage them and use them to the uh, to, uh, in, in favor of the game. Like Intrigue definitely encourages sandbagging. All right. Uh, and then we'll have these boxes out uh, at 3 o'clock. Working on our teams, it's going to be the last time you're going to see your teams before spring break. So you might want to give each other tasks to work on during spring break. Um, if you can't think of anything, test over spring break. You're pro a good number of you are going to see people who uh, uh, who haven't seen your game yet. Yeah. And, uh, Especially if you have written rules, if you have a first draft of your written rules, it's great. This is a great opportunity to take test that. Yeah. And if you don't have a first draft of written rules, then this last hour of class is probably a good time to bring up a laptop and just like start editing that text so that you have you can go into spring break with something that you can test with. All right? And for the game scheme token, is probably people to play twice, maybe play another game. But the other game are all about forty minutes. Yeah. What? The ground is longer uh, um, yeah, the ground is probably sixty yeah, ninety <coughs> the small world is forty to eighty. The rest are about forty. Also I can't get to a